Hello and welcome to the Arama Pulse webcast. Great to have you with us today for a really fascinating topic. We will get a glimpse and discuss some of the trends that are shaping and changing the process industries. And I promise you, you will get some deep insight today. And of course, you can join us. Just go to Slido with the hashtag Arama Pulse and ask all your questions, post your comments, and then you will be right here with us in the discussion and we will ask your questions to our expert. Now, what is this fascinating topic we're going to talk about today? Well, the chemical industry has for decades been based on coal, gas, oil, but not anymore. With the strive for more sustainability and driven by climate change, societies are looking for new resources. And one potential solution might be to go bio-based. Now, so far, bio-based processes for chemical production end up in some of the large bulk chemicals, such as ethanol, or in low-volume specialties. But California-based Genomatica has set out to do more and to aim higher. They want to produce widely used chemicals for everyday products. And their first process, the butane bio process, has already been commercialized, but there's more to come. And what there is to come, I'm very happy I have the opportunity today to ask the Senior Vice President for Research and Development of Dynamatica, Nelson Barton. So, Nelson, great to have you with us here today. Catherine, thanks a lot. Uh, really good to be here. Uh, you know, looking forward to giving you a brief introduction to Genomatica and starting a conversation that uh, we can extend in June. Yeah, great. Nelson, we have had a lot of headlines here in Europe as well uh, about Genomatica. And um, we have heard a lot. So why don't you just give us a bit more about your company? Tell us a bit more how Genomatica is working, what you are doing exactly. Okay, sounds good. I'll uh, use a few slides to help me uh, walk you through Genomatica. Um, let me do that here. Where did it go? Oh, I lost it now. There we go. We have that? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so we start with this first slide here where we show, you know, a, a, a fusion slide basically. Um, on the left side, you're seeing uh, a Novamont's 30,000 ton per year 1 4 butane diol plant. And, and this image is supposed to represent, you know, Genomatica's uh, goal of basically introducing bio-based products into society such that, you know, the things we use every day can be made in a more sustainable way. And so here's an overview of Genomatica. Um, you know, right now our first two product lines are commercial, um, plastics being the, the one for butane diol and then cosmetics as well. Um, both of the products deliver over a 50% lower greenhouse gas emission. Um, uh, the BDO plant is operating, as I said, at 30,000 tons capacity and the, and the cosmetics is in the thousands of tons and ramping depending on, on market demand. And then our newest announcement that we made uh, early in uh, 2020 is uh, our process development around bio nylon. So this is a fully sustainable uh, nylon six that uh, we're producing by fermentation. Um, and in January of 2020, we announced the production of the first metric ton. Um, then near the end of 2020, we announced that uh, we're going to scale that about 50 times uh, in uh, uh, the coming year in order to uh, put samples into customers' hands to validate the performance of the nylon as we continue to scale and develop this uh, fully renewable bio nylon process. Um, we, we, this represents our third uh, scale up that we've had uh, very successfully. Um, and with every process that we develop, we're really focused not only on uh, the environmental benefits, but being very cost competitive in the market. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, you know, Genomatica has been around since around 1998. However, we really did not start um, developing uh, the bioprocesses until uh, 2008. 
And, um, you know, for the first years of our existence, we were really a software company uh, developing software around metabolic engineering that uh, other companies could use to uh, actually do their own synthetic biology and, and microbial engineering. However, we made that switch uh, in the 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008 timeframe, such that we were gonna utilize our own software and actually develop genome-based bioprocesses uh, and take those to market. Um, along the way, we've uh, developed some really strong partnerships uh, with, with Aquafil around the nylon. Uh, we recently announced a par partnership with Covestro, uh, Novamont, obviously the first licensee of, our, of the, the butane diol process, Cargill as, a, as an important feedstock uh, provider uh, in certain situations, and then ExxonMobil, um, who we began working with uh, when we had the acquisition of the REG LS9 assets to make longer chain molecules. And increasingly, we're actually developing partnerships with brands as we see this very strong market pull for sustainable bioprocesses. And so, uh, you know, we, we've, we've successfully scaled three processes and that's the, the BDO on the far left there at 30,000 tons a year. In the middle is butylene glycol that goes into cosmetics that uh, right now it's at, at over 1600 tons and we continue to ramp that in a tolling based uh, approach to the manufacturing that's uh, essentially dependent on the market demand. And then as I mentioned, nylon now is, is, is under demonstration scale and uh, we're looking to continue to push up the numbers there in terms of uh, the amount we make in, in 2021. And then on the bottom there, it's just like, you know, we're not done once we get to, a, to the first commercial processes. We're always going to be looking to improve the economics. And I say, you know, in this example of Gino BDO, um, you know, the first plant in Europe from Novamont, we envision that the second plant will have, you know, even significantly better economics. Those economics, a lot of those economics, we can actually pass on to Novamont through improved strains or improved uh, processes associated with either the fermentation or the downstream processing. But now that we have that commercial plant operating, we're in a very good place to, you know, to continually uh, improve the process and, and the production out of the facility. And we envision that we're going to continue to drive costs down as we're able to push out, you know, more uh, plants, uh, uh, both on BDO and, and then, you know, the similar story will be told for, for butylene glycol and nylon and other products that we produce. Produce. And so now we get we get in a little bit about you know what's our what's our philosophy about developing these these processes and I think you know one of the things that sets Genomatica apart is that we're very very much focused on uh, what we say is begin with the end in mind that is you know our goal is to develop a commercial scale bioprocess with very competitive economics and the very significant sustainability benefits. But, you know, so in order to do that, we simultaneously are developing the organism and the, and the bioprocess together. I think, that, you know, one of the mistakes a lot of synthetic biology companies make is that they develop the organism first and then start thinking about, you know, how, how do they go about, you know, purifying the product after they've done that. Um, we get our process engineers involved uh, in the program, like right from the very beginning. Um, they're involved in, in helping us understand, you know, organism choice uh, based on, you know, what the, how the overall process will operate, both the fermentation and the downstream processing, as well as the overall pathways that we pick in terms of, you know, we're, we're obviously focused on pathways with the highest yield, but we, you really have to pay attention to the byproducts that are produced as well, because in examples like, like uh, BDO, where you're going to put it into a polymer, those very, very minor byproducts actually have a very significant impact on the ability to form polymers. And so you have to be very careful about um, your byproduct profiles right from the very beginning. So we have our process engineers weighing in on our strain engineering strategies right from the very beginning to help us understand that we're actually developing an organism that's gonna fit into a process that, that meets the, the requirements we have with respect to the, the titers, the rates, the yields, the recoveries, uh, and, and, and overall techno-economics of the process. And so, you know, Genomatica has assembled all of the capabilities that we need to go from in silico design through process deployment. And we are using these, you know, effectively right from the very beginning. Uh, when we consider a product, one of the first things that we'll do, in addition to just looking at the theoretical stoichiometric yields that we might be able to get out of the process, we take that 
combined with a yes a uh, a roughed out process design for how we'd recover the product and then put that all into a techno-economic analysis to make sure it makes sense. Once it makes sense, then then we would move forward, uh, you know, based on those criteria. And so when we start now to get in deeper and we're starting to think about the organism, one of the key things that you really need to think about with the organisms, it's not only the introduction of the heterologous pathway, putting the new genes into the organism in order to get your product of interest produced. A really key component of that is if you think of each individual enzyme that goes into your microorganism as essentially a new unit operation, very frequently those enzymes require redox. And I think, you know, one of the things that does get somewhat overlooked sometimes is making sure that you not only put these enzymes into the pathway and that they function efficiently, that you rebalance the energy of the organism such that it wants to maintain and actually, you know, utilize this pathway. And that's one of the ways that you can, you really ensure that you're gonna get the genetic stability you need is by rebalancing the energy of the organism such that it now functions optimally in the presence of the pathway. And so we spend a lot of time, um, you know, looking at the energy uh, optimization of the organism in, in the context of the heterologous pathway to make sure that, you know, not only do we get really good uh, carbon flux through our pathway, but we're also having an organism that's, you know, that's, that's actually optimized to, to function in that situation. And so that's one of the ways that we really ensure genetic stability at scale. And then finally, we've, we've spent a lot of time developing um, algorithms that allow us to mimic the heterogeneous environment that you see in a very large scale fermenter at small scale. And on the left is a, is a two liter stainless steel fermenter that we can pressurize and essentially um, oscillate the pressure within the tank such that we can mimic the heterologous conditions in say a 600,000 liter tank. And similarly, we can also change the gas composition in that tank in an in a, in a oscillating way to mimic changes in O2 and CO2 such that we're mimicking that really heterologous environment that the organism is gonna be in, uh, exposed to when it goes to commercial scale. And then we couple that with all of the diagnostics that we routinely use, the genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, the C13 fluxomics and metabolomics to understand, is this organism gonna perform as well under these heterogeneous conditions as it does at, uh, uh, under the sort of uh, well-mixed conditions of your standard two-liter fer fermenter. And so if we can get to a situation where that organism performs just as well under these oscillating conditions, then we're fairly confident we're going to be able to take it to scale uh, and see the type of performance we're looking for. And so, you know, we've done this numerous times. And, and when we take our scale down protocols, and in this example, you're looking at BDO titers, uh, two liters um, shown in the red dots there and the dotted lines and the 200,000 liters shown in the blue solid line that's actually uh, the commercial facility fermentation. You can see that, you know, using our scale down models, we're, we're able to, you know, predict very accurately how well um, this uh, the, the organism is going to perform at scale. And so we've done this with BDO, we've done it with the butylene glycol, and now most recently with the nylon. And in all situations, our scale down models are, are working very well to give us predictive performance across scale. And so, um, you know, we're seeing very similar titers rates and yields, as well as similar metabolic responses of the organism as a result of the, the scale down and the scale up uh, that we do have going on there. So that's just a little bit. That's just a, a, a small introduction to, to, to what we do at Genomatica. Um, you know, obviously, we're, there's a lot more going on and a lot more detail that we can go into in June, but I didn't want to take up too much time with the introduction and wanted to move more into a, a discussion. I'll just kind of close with Genomatica's core purpose, right, which is has always been to to lead this irresistible transition to sustainable materials that you know both involves our technology and and a, a united approach with industry leaders to to really make the world a better place. And uh, I'll just close there and uh, take any questions. Thank you, Nelson. That was impressive, and you make it sound really simple and really complicated at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds very, very easy as you tell it, but there's so many different factors in it. So when you started out with a BDO process, what was the biggest hurdle in all these different aspects you described? What was the biggest hurdle for getting it on the commercial scale? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think 
you know, and so hurdles, I guess, I get, what were the most important considerations? And I think some of the most important considerations that we had is that, you know, BDO is already a, a you know, very highly used chemical in the industry. So one of the things we had to make sure of is that we were making a BDO that met industry specifications. So we spent quite a bit of time, um, you know, producing enough representative BDO samples from our process that we could then hand off to BDO end users and have them come back and tell us, yes, this meets specification. Because as I said, you know, purity is critically important. And so those very minor impurities, you know, sometimes your analytical is going to tell you what, you know, that they'll, they'll work or not, and sometimes they won't. So you'll get a nice, clear looking BDO solution, you'll polymerize it, and it turns yellow. Right. And so that's just not going to work. Right. And so we had to make sure that we had a product that was going to meet industry specifications. The next thing we had to do was actually find a place where we could actually go demonstrate this at commercial scale in order to convince a really innovative company like Novamont to, to take on the risk of building the first commercial plant. Right. And so we were able to do that um, by actually going in and doing a five week trial at DuPont Tate and Lyle's PDO facility that was actually close enough in construction that it would work well for our BDO. So I think that commercial demonstration, as well as making sure that we had the product specification we needed, were the two things that kind of got us into that, that next step where we actually could get Novamont to commit to building the plant. Mm. Well, I think, um, yeah, it still sounds easy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's even one more factor to it right now. Um, if you have any more questions, dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, just go to Slido and post them. And the first questions are already coming in. But before I start on these, I have another one. You take a very holistic view on process development. You described this. And now we learned that even the customer has to be inter integrated somehow because you have to meet his specifications. Um, how do we make sure that everybody stays on the same page all the time during this process? These are very different people, plant designers, stem cell engineers, whatever. How do you keep them together? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things about Genomatica as well is that I so probably over 25% of my workforce are chemical engineers, right? And so they think about, you know, the processes. And that's, this goes all the way from the computational through strain engineering, enzyme engineering. You know, I've got chemical engineers thread throughout. And, and the process engineers really do sit in on the strain engineering meetings at the very early days to provide feedback. Because I think, you know, one of the things about developing bioprocesses, you always have... Uh, two approaches to to say something like a byproduct, right? If, if there's a byproduct that your organism is producing, the first thing you do is you ask the, the chemical engineers, is this going to be a problem for you in downstream processing? They tell you, no, it's going to go out right away in distillation. Don't worry about it. Okay, fine. But if they tell you, you know, no, yeah, this is going to be a big problem. It's going to co-purify with your product. All right, then the strain engineers have to solve it. They have to go in and figure out a way to minimize production in the organism, right? And I think, and all of those decisions are, are guided by the techno-economic analysis, which is also something that, you know, the, the end users are obviously paying massive attention to. And so in addition to the specifications provided by the customers, then, then it's up to our techno-economic analysis and the process engineers to really give us the input we need to make sure we're on the right track with the organism development. Okay. So let's ask the first question from the audience. Can your process also be used for anionic polymerization of caprolactame? Or is it, are there steps that where you need other, other, um, um, other techniques as well? Do you combine bio oh, yeah, so chemical it, steps as well? Yeah, so what we're, what we're doing is we're making the monomer for, for nylon. Mm -hmm. And then we're working with Aquafil at the current time too. And then Aquafil is turning that into the, into the bio nylon. And so at the current time, that's, that's the way we work with them. And that was actually, and that's actually something, you know, that was critical with this production of the first metric ton of, of nylon that we made. So we made the precursor, gave that precursor to Aquafil and then Aquafil are experts in, you know, taking that precursor and converting it to nylon and validating that the material we're making is of sufficient quality to, for, for the polymerization and the production of fiber. Mm. So you're staying within the bio-based processes and you combine it with chemical processes on the outside your own company, you just pass it on? Or do you also think about doing something hybrid in this case? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it depends. I mean, currently we're, we're staying, you know, right now at the, at the production of the, of the monomers. Um, but, you know, we, you know, 
depending on the products and, and where we end up, you know, uh, wanting to play within the value chain, you know, there is the opportunities that we would in the future consider moving further down the value chain. Um, but, but at the, you know, with, um, with the bio nylon right now, what we're doing is making the monomers and then allowing others to convert it to fiber. Um, another question, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, your approach seems to make a lot of sense. So, um, but where is the point where you say a process, a process doesn't really work? When do you abort? Is it yeah, early? I mean, think, is it yeah. late? Is it in between? Yeah, I mean, it could be really early, right? I mean, I think, uh, you know, for, you know, we definitely want to look at, you know, where can, where can a biological approach have the most impact, right? And so, you know, there are definitely, you know, some molecules wherein, you know, it's going to be challenging for biology, right? I mean, in some of the, some of the shorter, you know, some of the C2 molecules and such, they're going to be really challenging economics to compete with petrobase processes and, and, and a cracking approach, right? But then you get into, you know, there are definitely things that biology does incredibly well, right? It does, it does chirality really well. It does, you know, and it can make, um, you know, molecules in the C4 to C4 C18 range very, very well. And so um, you say, where, where does biology really have the ability to, to, to provide a performance advantage? And then you, then you look at the techno-economics in terms of, you know, if, if you're, you know, successful in meeting your tighter rate yield and recovery targets, you know, what do those economics look like? Are they going to be appealing to the industry? Um, and from that standpoint. And so I think, you know, before we really even get started, those are the things that we take a look at. And then obviously early in the program, when you're prototyping the pathway, you, you, you'll get a sense of just how hard it's going to be to, to engineer the organism to get there. Uh, and I think, um, you know, and then finally, you're also just looking at from the process side of things in terms of, you know, are there going to be any real process challenges with getting a molecule of the specifications you need? So. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the audience on uh, downstream processing, and I think that's something uh, everybody who's doing bioprocesses is concerned with. Um, right. Is the water evaporation in downstream processing for you still a cost driver, or are there alternatives? Yeah, I mean, we definitely look at alternatives, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, in a in a, in a very successful fermentation, you're talking about, you know, 15% product in water. So water is a significant uh, component there. And so, you know, you can look at, you know, different approaches to downstream processing and we're doing that, um, and, you know, and it just kind of depends on the product and the overall process economics is distillation going to work for you. Do you need to consider alternative approaches to, to, you know, getting your product out? Um, is there some sort of a liquid liquid extraction approach you could take that would make sense? Or are there other approaches to downstream processing that you can take um, if, if, you know, the cost of water removal becomes, uh, you know, a really significant contributor to the overall downstream processing cost? Um, how do you choose new products? Also a question from the audience, something similar I had uh, already taken down with. Uh, do you know about the limits for cell types or products? Do you know what works especially well? Are there things you won't touch because you know they won't work? How do you choose that? Yeah, no, and I think it comes back to what I was talking about earlier is one, you know, for a particular product, take a look at it from a, you know, the stoichiometric standpoint, like just, you know, you know, purely from a chemical reaction standpoint. And then from there we say, well, what's our, you know, practically where do we think we can get with respect to the overall yield in the biological process? Um, and what does that look like? So if you, you know, you put in your feedstock cost, you put in your, you know, what you think your convert your conversion efficiency could look like. And as I said, you know, sort of you, you, you piece together what the downstream processing could look like. And then we have very extensive models of, you know, equipment costs and those types of things so that we can put together a pretty accurate techno-economic analysis right away. And then what we do is we can bear, compare it to say best available technology in the petroleum industry and see where we sit. And we'll do that over, you know, over a time span of say 10 years, like varying sugar costs and varying the petroleum feedstock cost. And just to get an understanding of, can we be, you know, competitive from an economic standpoint? And that's one of the very first criteria we use. But then after that, we're also just kind of looking at the overall technical feasibility. Um, you know, so, you know, if, if our models kick out, you know, what are the enzymes required? Um, how, how challenging is it to work with those enzymes? You know, are those enzymes, you know, going to, you know, be uh, amenable to engineering and those types of things that we just take an overall technical uh, assessment as well as just, um, you know, what, what is the market demand for the product as well? I mean, is there going to be a, a significant demand and pull for a, for a bio-based process? Mm -hmm. 
Now, we have also talked about other resources uh, lately, and in the course of Ahmad Pulse, there will also be um, sessions on hydrogen or on chemical recycling. Do you think that one day we will live in a world where all products end up being bio-based, or do we always need other resources as well? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I, 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 you know, um, and in, I'm as anxious as you are to see how things unfold over the, over the coming years. But I think, you know, it will more than likely be a mix, right, of, of different technologies. And there's lots of, um, you know, exciting work going on, not only in, in biomanufacturing approaches that we're taking. Um, you know, right now, you know, we're really heavily focused on plant-based feedstocks in the front end of the circular economy, but we're also got an eye towards, you know, C1 feedstocks and really participating fully in, in the circular economy by, you know, using recycled C1 uh, as, a, as a feedstock. But I think there are, you know, a number of exciting, you know, technologies being developed that will all contribute to the mix of things that uh, will, you know, improve the way we manufacture the stuff we use every day. Well, we are certainly looking forward to what Genomatica will be doing in the future. And we will have a chance in June. So thank you for today very much, Nelson Barton, for being with us today, early in the morning in California, late in the afternoon in Europe. No problem. And very good to be here and look forward to June. I do too. Thank you again. All righty. Thanks much. And I know there are questions left. I have some left as well. But don't worry. This was only an appetizer you will have the opportunity to hear more about Genomatica and about other bio-based pioneers at Achma Pulse in June. And you will hear more from Nelson Barden as well and have the chance to ask more questions and hear more about the work of this company. So go to our website, make sure to register and get your ticket and join us at Achma Pulse in June on 15th and 16th. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. <laughs>